Welcome to episode two of our Sensing Deep Space video log series. I'm Dr. Jancy McPhee, founder and executive director of the nonprofit Sired Exchange. Today is a totally awesome day. We're joined by Dr. Carol Christian, a distinguished astronomer from the Space Telescope Science Institute and she will be sharing her insights about the scientific research behind our upcoming multi-sensory installation, which is inspired by Pandora's cluster. So let's just dive right in. Hi, Carol. Hi, Jancy, how are you? It is so awesome to have you here. And you. Um, it, I really appreciate your taking the time. And also you've been taking lots of time to work with our team to help them understand the data sets that are informing our artwork and actually to select them. So maybe could you start by just telling us a little bit about the research that's gone into understanding Pandora's cluster, please? Sure. So first of all, I wanna lay the groundwork a little bit. One of the big questions that we have in astronomy and especially is rel relevant to JWST is that we wanna understand at the early phases of the universe, how galaxies, stars, and all the other stuff formed because it had to form out of whatever came out of the big bang, which was initially radiation and some particles. How does that end up being the universe that we have today? Another big, situation that I think um, has helped us, but also given us a little bit of a puzzle, are gravitational lenses. And gravitational lenses are formed um, by a mass, which then warps the space around it. And so a small mass can do this. Um, in fact, our sun actually creates a gravitational uh, bending of light around it. And in the early days when this was first proposed, people actually took pictures of eclipses and proved that the mass of the sun um, did change the light path from distant objects. And then they take a picture when the sun wasn't there and they could see, they compared the two, two observation, they could see that the space was curved. So if you have a very large mass, then it will provide a very large lens, gravitational lens, and so it will bend space a lot. And we can actually use this to look at more distant objects because not only is the light path bent, it is also magnified. So, but we wanna understand lenses themselves. And so the theory of the lens, I mean, I just said it fairly simply, there's a mass, it bends the light around it. But when you have a complicated mass, it's just not a sphere, um, like a cluster of galaxies, then it's a very complicated lens and you have to understand the lens. So it's like understanding your glasses to understand what you see. So understanding lenses is an important problem in physics as well as deep universe. And we have lots of other interesting things in astrophysics that we want to understand, but those are the two most relevant to Pandora's cluster. And so Pandora's cluster is actually one of a, a bunch of clusters that were chosen. Well, we, we've known about gravitational lenses and clusters of galaxies. These are a bunch of galaxies that come together and they form a very large group and of course a very large mass, so a very large lens. And Pandora's cluster is one of several that we had chosen to study with the Hubble Space Telescope because we wanted to extend the reach of Hubble by using the lens magnification, the gravitational lens magnification property so that we could see faint things very much further away. And Pandora's box is one of the really beautiful lenses. The galaxies in it are very, um, beautiful and actually the lens themselves, the arcs and the magnification that that lens makes are, are really fantastic. And then of course, a lot of the light from the early universe is shifted to the red. So that's where JWST comes in because it is built to be most sensitive in the infrared. And so now we have new imagery from 
JWST. But I also say this cluster has been studied in x-rays and radio, um, as well as Hubble and JWST. So we know a lot about Pandora's cluster and some things about the distant galaxies that are being lensed. It's, it's awesome how science can inspire art like this and how even just the, the imagery that is reduced from all the data and the technology to collect those data can inspire people. And I was wondering if you could maybe shed a little bit more light on on the on the technology that is behind both the James Webb Space Telescope and and you know relevant for for what we're pulling together for this art installation. Well, both Hubble and uh, James Webb were created. Hubble is more a classic telescope. It's very similar in design to ground-based telescope, which astronomers have used for a long time. Um, James Webb, because we knew it was going to be a big telescope, and we actually are thinking about larger telescopes for the future, but James Webb is a pretty big telescope, and there was no way to get a single mirror into space, and so it had to be segmented. We have built segmented telescopes that have operated on the ground, but that's easy because you can build a support structure, and people go up and fix it and tune it and all that. You're going to put it in space. It's quite an amazing feat, and so a long time was taken to perfect the technology. So it's essentially a mirror, they are mirrors and they're gold coated and they're in segments. And those segments are arranged to look like a big mirror, but there are spaces in between. So the challenge is when the light comes into each mirror, it that light has to be combined into one very crisp, tight, uh, image so that every field that we take, every scene that we take in of the universe comes out crisp and at high resolution. So the high resolution is really the important thing. Hubble has beautiful high resolution in the visual and the ultraviolet and good resolution in the infrared. And James Webb complements that with exquisite resolution in the infrared. So we're extending our reach of um, what we can look at uh, as we look out in the universe, especially for these distant objects. Right, so, so basically these telescopes extend our own human capabilities to, to be beyond what we could do on our own. And, and I think it, there's there's kind of a little bit of art to pull, pulling together the data so that you know, even the uh, even for the astronomer, there can be interpretation of these results. You know, do you do you have any insight and anything you want to say a little bit about how how that that works? Um, y yes, I, I do think that. Well, first of all, just understanding the data, the creativity of understanding the data, and how you can't just like look at it and then draw conclusions. You have to do measurements, and you have to be clever in how you measure because we can't go out there and touch this stuff. So everything we do is through looking at radiation of some sort, radio, x-rays, even gravitational radiation. We we are receiving information from the universe, but we can't touch these objects. So we have to imagine what the 3D structure is and model that. And we have theories and to test and then take more data and uh, compare to the theories. But it, it's, it sounds sort of cut and dry, but it's not. It takes a lot of imagination and interest and creativity to create the observations, to analyze the observations, and then also for the theoretical models. And I would say, I mean, that's sort of the science side of it, but the other side of it is we want, for the exhibit, we just wanted to capture everybody's kind of, oh, wow, look at that. You know, that's sort of a, a visceral response to, to imagery that is being taken of the universe. and and many people feel it it's kind of as a connection with the universe through the, the these beautiful images and the other thing is that at least i'm a proponent of i've always tried worked uh, in my career with education and outreach worked with teams that have quite diverse expertise and experiences and i think that's important because 
you know, as an astronomer, I'm sort of trained to look at things in a certain way and analyze in a certain way. It's not to say it's not creative, but it, the task is kind of laid out. Whereas when, when we started talking about the exhibit, people had different ideas about how they perceived what we were doing and what the imagery was about and about the universe and about the telescopes. And all of that creativity and different thinking is helpful in trying to make um, the experience and also convey the experience to other people because we have to reach other people on all different levels, both their emotional, their scientific, analytical, their art side, all, all things that make up people. Um, there are different ways of understanding the imagery and we wanted to be creative with how we represented the data, not just an image and say, well, here it is, go for it. So we wanted to be a little more immersive in, in the experience. And that, that takes not only the scientists, but it takes, you know, visualization experts, sound experts, people who uh, understand tactile experiences things like that. So we need all of that to create an exhibit. And also it, it also helps us understand the science better, I think. Well, it's been really wonderful to talk to you and, and get these incredible insights into how science and art are supporting each other, actually, not just to create this installation, but actually to, to, analyze the data that comes from the, the amazing technology like the space telescope, like JWST, and, and basically to just allow us to, to learn more about deep into space and the origins of the universe. So thanks again so much, Carol. Absolutely. It was great talking to you. Thank you.